Uh, the first question is, uh, what's your, um, no, what is the best thing for a human being? I'm thinking of a line of um, one of the writers for the Tattler, Edison or Steele, was asked like uh, what it takes to make a human being happy. He said, um, someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. That is nice. What year is he writing that about? Um, 17th or 18th century, I'm not sure. It's like when journals start to form. Beautiful. Boy, talk about great answers. <clears throat> what is your favorite form of information? Books. Uh, uh, Printed work. Of course. Yeah. 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 But now, uh, uh, books are kind of uh, bleeding into the net and internet, so yeah. I, was, I was like reading on the computer when you came here. Yeah. A, a political blog. Yeah. And uh, did you grow up a reader on your own choice, or did you see your parents reading a lot? My mother was an avid reader. My father, my, my, my father read the papers, and uh, they're both readers. Yeah. My mother read to us as kids those stories, and um, I learned to read before I went to school, um, mostly by memorizing. You know, not, no, I couldn't understand the words. It was like just a, a mnemonic feat. Uh, but yeah, I was always interested in reading. Hmm. And why do you think humans collect information? Well, it's uh, survival. I mean, the more information you have, the better oriented you are in the world. The more you know what your, what your position is, um, what your options are. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this tendency to collect information is hardwired, or do we learn it? I think it's hardwired. Um, I just adopted a cat. Um, uh, there's been a, like, a loose cat in the neighborhood as we go in the house. The house and I've been giving her treats and she comes to my door and stands on her hind legs and scratches the glass like a puppy to come in. So and um, she's got a lot of curiosity and like explorers, so I think it's kind of learned to be mammalian. You've got the nose, so you know, yeah. sensing things out. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Um, can you conjure up your earliest memory? Well, I don't know. Um, my earliest memory is uh, being at a like a ladies' home bureau club with my mother, a woman's craft club, and you know, um, might have been at her house, uh, of being underneath a card table or something, and of reaching up and getting olives and pickles, <laughs> and then of being sick. Because uh, you overate them. I overate <laughs> That's great. But I remember like I had to like reach over the top of the table to get these things. Uh -huh. I'm so sure. <laughs> um, do you think memory is a curse or a blessing? Both. Uh, both. Yeah, I think it works both ways. Yeah. More a blessing than a curse. Yeah. There's a footnote in Finnegan's Wake I like um, in the schoolroom chapter. Um, if we if we could each always do all if we could each always do all we ever did. <laughs> Wait. Say it slower. If we could each always do. If we could each always do what we always did. I wonder if I could find it. Oh, that's all right. And so, but but what yeah, what are you interpreting as in regards to memory? But if you could actually like remember everything you did in your life, you'd have like a really full life, huh? And I, I'm remembering now reading excerpts of Bellman's biography of Joyce, where he's lying on his back in the hospital, like blind because of his eye trouble. So, just remembering things. That's what he talks about doing. It's like going back over his life and remembering. You mean Joyce is laying in the bed? Yeah. Yeah, and he's telling yeah. Elma. This, and he he writes it up, or is he quoting Joyce? He's uh, quoting Joyce. Ta I think talking about it. Uh, right. Relatives or whatever. Right. Very interesting. We just visited our dear friend Walter Liggett, who's a poet, lives five blocks from here, and is in a hospital five blocks from here. And he's we're sort of reviewing yesterday in his hospital room what he what's going through your head, and he says, "I'm reviewing my life." Mm -hmm. you know, Tuesday, I just learned one of my, uh, my mother's youngest brother, um, my uncle, is going to die in a couple of weeks. He's had a lot of bladder cancer and stuff, yeah. and his kidneys are filling out, but they gave him, like, a week, couple weeks to live, and he knows it, I think. Uh, yeah. But he's reconciled, too. He's with his kids. They're laughing and crying. Yeah. Sounds pretty intense. <coughs> Very, yeah. So who were your earliest role models within your immediate family and then outside your immediate family? And maybe just briefly, what in particular you got from them influence? Mm -hmm. Well, my mother and father, um, uh, but they're both part of me now. Yeah. 
Um, my father was like a, a, a real hard worker and had this real hard work ethic. He was also critical of himself and what he did, so I inherited from him like a kind of drive to work uh -huh. and a sense of responsibility and also a kind of self-critical thankfully too. But the older I get, the more I admire him because he like raised the family and stuck it out with, the, with all of us, so mm -hmm. supported us. And what do you think you got from your mom? Um, a kind of intellectual passion. She uh, she had, had ambitions as a girl, but they were poor, and so she actually wanted to go to nursing school, but her father wouldn't let her because it cost more than secretarial school, so she ended up doing that. I'd, I'd, I'd really love to have known what she would have done if she had gotten a college degree because she's a very smart woman, and I have a reader, and um, yeah, I got a lot from her. Mm. She's an incredibly kind person, too. Mm. Uh, how about outside your immediate family? Any um, role models or mm, influences? A couple of teachers. I, I, when I started having male teachers, like um, my first male teacher was when I was in fourth grade, and I had a male teacher in the fifth grade too, and then more and more male teachers as I got older, but realizing that guys could have positions as, um, well, a teachers I guess stood in for like intellects in my small town. And um, all my father's uh, friends were into like manual labor, um, heavy drinkers, sports, um, so finding somebody that had like a life of the mind uh, meant something. Hmm. And, um, and this was role models from books too, like Joyce became a role model after a certain time. Right. Any um, authors you could mention before you got into Joyce and you said uh, Ulysses 66, mm -hmm. any authors that, uh, you know, you were attracted to or influenced you? I, well, I read. A, I was always an avid reader, so um, Homer. Um, maybe that's one of the things that got me into Joyce. Okay. Because, um, I read prose translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was like twelve, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they're great adventure stories. Um, yeah. Boys' adventure stories and then Greek myths. Um, and I had a pretty good uh, English department in my high school who like uh, ran us through a series of. Uh, Great books, and in particular, my senior year, I had a teacher who was uh, a Faulkner fanatic, um, who got us to read Faulkner, but also Joyce, uh, T. S. Eliot, um, some more difficult writers. Great, thank you for that. Um, <coughs> were you raised a particular religion? Uh, Greek Catholic, uh, well, actually Ukrainian Catholic. Um, well, for my grandparents are Ukrainian, and so I went to a uh, church that did the, uh, the liturgy of James St. John Christ Chrysostom. The uh, it's the Eastern Rite uh, liturgy as opposed to Roman Catholic, um, but the church was affiliated with Catholicism and recognized the Pope. Um, it was just all done in Slavic. I see. And so, did you uh, have you found yourself uh, checking out ever, or are you practicing in that religion still? Or no, I was. I would go to church with my mother when I when I uh, toward the end of her life um, when I went back home to see her because I knew she liked it. Um, but you I, I started to feel like bad about having like dropped out of the church and it hurt, hurt her feelings. It was, it was more a matter of like um, not wanting to upset her than having any attachment to the religion. And, yeah, I don't have any attachments to any institutional religion. So, and you and you would say since your childhood you didn't have any attachments since about since I left uh, left home and went to college. Right. Okay. And so, do you think evil people exist, or does evil use people as a vehicle? I don't think there's anything that's like abstract evil. It's like evil is, uh, it's in the human mind. Um, humans are the ones who create evil. Yeah. So I, th I think there are evil people. Yeah. Hmm. In this question... I can tell you if you, if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> well, this question, you can maybe in this question, this is dealing with how you, this question deals with how you deal with your enemies. So I'm going to set it up with a few quotes just to give a basis here. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Mm -hmm. Ram Das says, I'm having a real hard time loving George Bush or Madoff or whoever you want to fill in the blank. Coppola took from the mob, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Hmm. Um, JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. Chinese proverb is, he who cannot agree with his enemy is controlled by them. And then I've added the last because of Levi Strauss just passing recently. Mm -hmm. He talked about the cannibals he studied, boiled their friends, and roasted their enemies. 
So maybe starting off, how you deal with your enemies and, and what do you think of the Watts thing? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. I think there's a lot to that. Yeah. So uh, there, there are some people I had gotten into spats with academically. And in my, I just didn't, didn't like give them even a footnote in my book. Um, they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but I also like to have case statement there. Um, forgive your enemies, but don't forget who they are. Yeah. And an Irish toast you will like. Um, may God bless those who love us, and those who do not love us, may he turn their hearts. And if he cannot turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles, so that we can recognize them by their limping. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so this is, uh, who who would write that? It's just a traditional Irish toast. A traditional Irish toast, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you think Joyce dealt with his enemies? Oh, he's savage. Uh, they're all out like lampoons, and you know, he was using them as well, they're named by name. Yeah. Um, look, look, Buck, Buck Mulligan, uh, all over Sinjan Gokery. Um, he was hurt by the portrait he got in Ulysses because his portrait is like amoral, um, uh, uncaring, valueless. Uh. And, and that's interesting. Because Dante did that too. I mean, people Dante did, did that too. Put them in hell. Yeah. And they were still alive. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, this is interesting. Do you can satire be destructive? Sure, it comes from the Greek meaning like, like uh, or sarcasm comes from the Greek uh, tearing the flesh. So um, yeah, set, uh, uh, humor has a, a kind of capacity to hurt. Um, right. And um, ethnic jokes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve Allen says, behind every joke there's a grievance. So in Freud, uh, too, he says that jokes are like socially acceptable modes of expressing either dirty things um, or else aggressive things, aggressive and hostile things. Right. And then if a joke's, I mean, what's the function of comedy? So good question. Uh, you know, I've been thinking of teaching a course on theory of comedy for a long time, but don't know how I would do it, so I haven't done it. But I like Freud's uh, 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 book on comedy, uh, Jokes in the Relation to the Unconscious. Because um, for him, comedy is, uh, laughter is a kind of safety valve that allows you to, to boil off um, um, emotions and ideas that otherwise would be um, pathogenic. What's think, that word name? Uh, disease causing. Boil off, yeah, that's good. So I Joyce believe this too. I think uh, there's a point where he's writing Finnegan's Wake, and he says um, in in a uh, um, in Risu Veritas, and in laughter there's uh, truth. And it got me to think. Who of, said that? Joyce did. But you said it in another language. It's like there's a Latin uh, phrase in ben, in Vino Veritas, and in wine there people in wine there's truth. But Joyce changed it to in Risu Veritas, and in R I S U. In laughter, there's a truth. So he took a Latin phrase and changed. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. There's truth. That's great. So, and, and like uh, during the Spanish Civil War, he was uh, flustered at the fact that politics was getting a lot of people's attention and, as opposed to putting his wake. And he said something to the effect of, um, Isn't it better to make jokes the way I am instead of bombing things the way they are in Spain? Um, implying that like joke making was a, 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 a social safety valve. Now, if you think about laughing, uh, can you think and laugh at the same time? Um, I, I, can, I, I, there, I, I don't think you can. I think there's something about laughter that shuts off thought um, and reveals it to be a kind of experience in the unconscious that um, you go blank when you laugh. And there are kinds of laughter, too, where like you tear up and, and cry or even like wet yourself. And if you take, like, compare a picture of somebody laughing to somebody crying, it's hard to tell them apart. And I suggest the laughter is cathartic and attaching to the unconscious in some way. So it's, uh, it's important to laugh to be a part of Finnegan's Wake for that reason, as you know from the uh, uh, your web address. That, <laughs> thank you so much. That you, you just incited so many great ideas. First one was um, Frank Zappa says you, you can't come and laugh at the same time. Oh, you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. And then Robin Williams said. We should fight. You, can, you can come and be laughed at at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Robin Williams said um, we should uh, fight wars with rubber chickens 
and do what uh, the gentleman we just interviewed said, dozens. Um, he said, uh, what do you say, d doing the dozens, or yeah. came from Ireland. I think it's African American. Is it African American? Sort of. and, and it's like you take a rubber chicken and says, Your mother wears army boots, and you throw it at the other guy. And then, you know, uh -huh. instead of th killing him, you throw jokes at him or do do uh -huh. dozen. The old mama so fat that when God said, Love every life, he had to say, Move out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> but was there some form of dozens in Ireland? Uh, uh, I'm the Irish, but always better joking in a. Uh, 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 Talking of culture and yeah. the gift of the gab, Barney. Um, yeah. Talking is uh, a social skill in Ireland, and it's also like uh, masculine. Um, I think in America, you know, guys are acculturated to be quiet, like Gary Cooper or Clint Eastwood. Um, that uh, talking is like effeminate, but in Ireland, it's uh, it's a sign of machismo. Yeah, and that that's good. Do you know that uh, definition of Barney? Because I I misplaced it. Do you know this definition of Blarney? I, I, I'm going to get it wrong, but it's essentially you lead someone to hell and you help them realize that it's a good thing. Uh -huh. Something like that, but but I'll get that it to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And on laughter, one last thing, uh, Gurdjieff said laughter is the reconciliation of yes and no. Uh -huh. Yeah. So onward and upward, that was beautiful. Joyce, uh, that be maybe you'll correct me, I use this line all the time. Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin, and he pretty much checked out. This was 100 years ago, ex exactly this year, in fact. Mm. And he says he checked out, and he says, uh, why should you go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when you can go outside and see a real tree? And then Faulkner, years later, is saying, uh, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we, as humans, have to recreate or create things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theater and see a movie, uh, see a, a play of a life? Why don't we just live life? Um, uh, a complicated question, huh? And I can't come up with an easy answer, but I'm put in mind of this debate that Henry James had with Walter Besant at the turn of the century. Besant had written an essay claiming the novelists should only write from their experience and what they know. Um, and James uh, uh, was uh, uh, bothered by this, and uh, his feeling was that like uh, life is like a messy blur unless we have art and things that help clarify it and tell you what to look at and um, what things to appreciate. So for James, it wasn't that art reflected life, but art kind of made life possible. It made it, it enhanced it, and uh, made people able to see it with larger minds and bigger eyes. So and it does that for, Ulysses does that for me. I mean, reading Ulysses makes me, which is a book about June 16th, 1904, makes me think about November 21st, 2009, with a kind of intensity that I wouldn't, if I hadn't read Ulysses, it just asks you to look at the everyday with minuscule and wondrous attentiveness, too. It makes like day-to-day -day life really interesting. Beautiful. I always say, somewhere I got that line, Joyce helped, said, find epiphanies in everydayness. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or, or uh, another way of putting it is he, he found out, uh, or one of them was looking at Homer and Joyce, was, Ezra Pound's view is that Joyce wanted to belittle Bloom and show how trivial and sterile 20th century life had become in, compar in comparison to the sinewy and muscular heroics of Odysseus. But if you read the Odyssey, it, we tend to forget that when Odysseus gets home and discovers that suitors have been besieging his wife, he uh, um, kills them all and cuts off all their noses and ears and testicles and feeds them to his dogs. And he hangs all the servants who help help the uh, suitors. And then the question is, like, do we want people in the 20th century walking around the streets cutting off each other's ears and noses and genitals? Is that really heroic? Um, not anymore. And so it, it leads you to see that Bloom is uh, getting through life like with a a modicum of dignity and uh, resilience is a heroic thing as anybody can do these days. And so one of the things Ulysses does is also make like day-to-day -day life seem invested in this kind of mythic aura. Uh, living life is a heroic activity. That was beautiful. And treating people decently too. Yeah. <coughs> and, and on that, that was very good, thank you. And on that note, um, McLuhan said, may I suggest art in the electronic age is not a form of self-expression, but a kind of research and probing. It is not the private need of expression that motivates the artist, but the need of involvement in the total audience. This is humanism in reverse, 
Art in the electronic age is the experience not of the individual, but of collectivity. Mm -hmm. Do you find that explains what Joyce is doing? I do. Um, by way of Nabokov and Lolita, who um, um, he's Lolita likes to go to plays and see movies and dramas and stuff. And he, he's a professor, so he likes to read alone. So he says he likes to have books that he can take into his room where he can pump out the stuff. And what I think what that means, he's like calling attention to the 19th century reading protocol where you get a novel and you can lock yourself into your bedroom and either masturbate or, or cry, depending on the plot of the novel, you know, uh, pump out the stuff. And um, you didn't need a dictionary even to read the novel, you could just do it in total privacy. But with Joyce, um, you need to get outside of your room, you have to go look like read the Odyssey, look in dictionaries, um, go to the stacks, go to Dublin ideally, um, because he references Dublin in a way that you can't get from books. Um, and also, for me, he directs you outside into like the world of everyday experience to um, um, make that a part of your reading of the novel. So you can't like read Ulysses in, in, a, in solitude in a room without getting out there. And that's a collectivity thing. Yeah. And how about the, the artist reflecting whatever the technology is uh, dominant at that time? Is mm -hmm. that part of the art thinking process too? Is that, well, the, the, the point uh, I heard recently was, the idea I heard recently was that Cezanne broke the picture, scattered the picture and, you know, helped spawn cubism. And mm -hmm. indeed, well, it was actually Bob who said, well, it wasn't Cezanne who did it, it was the Telegraph who did it. And Cezanne was sort of reacting to the Telegraph. Uh -huh. So you've read Donald Thiel, so you know uh, that yeah. Joyce was fascinated with the new media, yeah. new technologies, and, and, and uh, Thiel's argument is that it influenced Joyce's writing profoundly. And I think it did. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I could say how. Um, I do know that Finnegan's Wake, he references like tele telegraphy, telephony, television even, um, radio, wireless, um, Morse code. Yeah. And, and uh, the, on that and point... Then you your take that Joyce invented experimental cinema. Like, there is like the uh, the rudiments of uh, hypertext and things like that. Yeah. Every word kind of connects with something else in the text and yeah. outside of the text too. Yeah. It was actually your great booking of J. Dylan Brown that spawned that. I was sitting there listening to him give that uh, give that talk, and I goes, "Oh my God!" And you know, I the conference. So. Yeah, your conference, and then I tracked him down. I forgot what his talk. He was a student of mine. Yeah. Oh, I tracked him down, and he goes, "Well, I can send you the paper, but it's the unedited version." I goes, "Are you kidding?" And the first thing his paper starts with is a McLuhan quote and an Eisenstein quote, and I was like, "Holy heck!" I forgot his paper entirely. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's not ex so much <coughs> what he says experimental sil film in there, but that was. But he's not a Caribbean literature expert. Yeah, yeah, he he was very nice about saying that. But in that regard, I was just wondering what your take on this line from the wake is, and what the general uh, academics say. Television kills telephony in Brothers Broil. Our eyes demand their turn. Let them be seen. Mm -hmm. First of all, what's the general academic say? Anything? Anybody have No, any? there's, no gen uh, there's no general academic Sam Finnegan's way because most academics don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean the general, uh, how many books did we decide there's on a uh, thousand books on so Joyce? I'm, I'm Anybody no, say I'm not, anything? I'm not sure there's a consensus right. on that line. Uh, and what's your take on that line? Well, I, I mean, television literally means seeing at a distance, right? Um, Tell us, Greek tell us is distant. Um, is that right? Um, I think so. And telephony means like hearing at a distance too. Okay. So they become like um, ciphers for me for the kinds of vision and hearing that you have in the night when your eyes are closed. It's lo like a, you're looking at television, you're not looking at something that's right in front of you. It's something that's like coming to you from somewhere else. And dream vision is like that too. And telephony too is like uh, hearing things that are remote. And Joyce pointed out that when you're asleep, your ears are always open, <coughs> and uh, uh, acting as like watchmen on the dark. When dreams happen, the eyes must like take over the hearing. Uh, whatever happens to you visually must uh, dominate that that kind of like uh, wakeful auditory attentiveness. So I would see it as a moment in the wake when like 
visual activity is starting to arise and the ears are uh, um, being made secondary. But then beyond that, I mean, he's calling attention to the paradoxical nature of um, Western languages, which are phonetic. Um, you look at these marks on the page visually, but the marks designate sounds. So uh, sound and sight are kind of implicated in all language. And Derrida would say that's true even of spoken language, that even illiterate people, though they can only talk and can't write, couldn't talk if there hadn't been like a, a, a structured language there before them had already been written down, waiting for waiting, waiting to learn it. Yeah, that was good, thank you. That's immense. There's a lot in there. Um, so, um, this is about intention in art making. A, film, a screenwriting teacher said, I think a great film is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. And then someone else said, well, Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. Can you, he says, I, I think a great film is when you cannot clearly see, you know, no. that ambiguity. Um, in your own writing, you can talk about intention, but I imagine you're writing something with intention. Can you talk about Joyce and your reflections on Joyce, his intention? Did it, did it, well, you know, and know. that ambiguity thing. I mean, he's the most ambiguous writer ever with Finnegan's Wake in a way, mm -hmm. but in another way, is it all, you know, how would you approach that idea? Great art is clearly seeing the intention or not seeing the intention in regards to the way? Well, um, that's a complicated question because as you know, uh, for a long time, trying to figure out what the author meant was the goal of like literary reading and analysis. And then uh, uh, in the 50s or 60s when the new criticism uh, started to become dominant, uh, two influential critics developed this idea of the intentional fallacy. You can never know what another person's intentions are. All you have to work with is like the document they left you. And you can like hypothesize that you're getting at their intentions, but whether or not you are, it's finally unascertainable. And so the, the text itself is like what communicates. And then uh, when you get to Roland Barthes, um, in an essay called The Death of the Author, in Foucault, in an essay called What is an Author? It doesn't matter what the author intended because the text has a life of its own. It can mean anything you want it to mean. I'm bugged by this because um, um, for me there's a differential range of like self-consciousness among some writers know what they're doing and um, you know try to like get their intentions straight and other writers just kind of like go and sort of see where it leads them. And my, my sense of choice is that he was very self-conscious and knew what he was doing and so in my work I like to see how his intentions are fulfilled in the work, which makes me hated by some people who think that Finnegan's Wake should be like the ultimate work of, of uh, meaninglessness. That doesn't mean, it, it means whatever you want to make, make it mean. Right. So trying to see it, uh, that it's a dream, as George said it was, yeah. is um, straight jacket in the book. But I think George was smarter about Finnegan's Wake than almost anybody else writing about him, so I just assumed to see what he thought about it, as opposed to like a deconstructionist. Yeah, that was good. Um, but the <coughs> incredible thing about all this is new criticism. You're talking about I.E. Richards, uh, Renee Wellick, and uh, uh, Warren Wellick uh, came up with the. Uh, I can't remember the first names. The right, whatever. The intentional fallacy. Intentional fallacy. Okay. And the effective fallacy too. They came up with which the idea that you can't really talk about the power of literary work by saying that like it made your flesh creep or right. uh, move you to tears. So how it affects you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because we can study all of Joyce's letters and we can study everything his friends say and then go, we're trying to get to the root of his intentions and his meaning. Mm -hmm. And then, as Bob does, we can go to mediums and talk to Joyce from the grave, which sounds crazy and wacky. And then we can also keep in mind... Actually, I learned a couple of years ago that like uh, Henry James in his late life, when he was writing these incredibly tortuous novels, took to dictating. He didn't write. Right. He dictated. And one of his amanuenses was this woman named Theodora Basanque, who was a member of the Society for Psychical Research, Sciences and Spiritualism and stuff. So after James died, she claimed that he was channeling her and dictating novels from beyond the grave. 
So there are actually some novels that Henry James wrote after he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in keeping all that in mind, and then you study all this, this intention and whatever, how do we know two things? That Joyce might, because he's such a sophisticated, that he might go, I'm going to tell people all this stuff to fake them out even more. Well, that's always possible. Right. And also, he might not know. Like, I mean, that's sort of what I, I guess the new prison is. They might go, I wrote this to keep people, like Joyce wrote, I wrote this to keep my, to have me live on forever. Mm -hmm. And might go, he might not, as we all know, when we say, I think I did this because of, here's my reason, that that might not be the correct reason. That's true. You know, we might not know the correct reason and we're just trying to articulate it the best we can. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Those are two other factors, yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I see you know, something, something you said reminded me of something, but um, now it's lost. You're like uh, Joyce, remember to forget. Well, I was going to say, like uh, uh, Joyce, when we talk about Joyce, Joyce said this about Ulysses, um, it kind of put so many puzzles in it, what people professed believe for centuries. He told that to somebody who told it to Elman. But how do we know that person is remembering Joyce accurately? Right. Or, or not making it up? Right. So when we're talking about Joyce, we're really talking about Joyce. So right. It's, it's all like, right. he's there because we read about things that he's supposed to have said or said to other people. Right. And, and as much as I believe everything you're telling me today, and I appreciate it, you could be putting me on. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe you are. Mm -hmm. But that's the, the beauty of, of the complication of communication is there's multi-layers. Mm -hmm. And I, I always say, I think Joyce had that sort of sense that I'm going to trick people a little and trick them a little farther and trick them a little farther. And we don't know, even if he is, but it's uh, somewhat, this lady says, she's a compassionate trickster. Mm -hmm. or, or like when I say genuine fake, Bob would say he's a responsible fake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, they, that, those words carry negative connotations, so I'm not trying to put... I think he's a, a much needed, uh, brilliant contributor to writing and art and not trying to put him down, you know, mm -hmm. say. Um, or, or as Warhol and Zap, uh, Warhol and McClellan both said, art is anything you can get away with. Huh? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I go that far. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so you've, I've imagined your main writing utensil most of your life was paper, uh, pen or yeah. keyboard, pen? Uh, pencil, I like Pencil, I like word. yeah. Um, and McLuhan said, uh, you know, clothing's extension of our skin, knife and fork extension of our teeth, everything we invent's extension of some human. This is Vico. I mean, think of the word arms. Does Vico say it before? Well, Marshall got it from Vico then. Well, he got it from a lot of guys, uh, but... You know, like, uh, uh, everything in human culture is an extension of the body for Vico. Um, is that Vico? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, the teeth of a comb, the head of the class, the mouth of the river. Um, but arms, uh, the right to bear arms, uh, everybody's born with arms, um, and then we're given the right to bear them. So uh, if you think about the meaning of arms, it's like people are really puny, need to buy arms because their arms aren't big enough. <laughs> That's beautiful. So what do you think the pencil's an extension of what human sensorium do you It comes from the same word as penis, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Some of that hangs down. Right. It's a little tentacle. But yeah, an extension, well, extension of the brain and of the, of the hand as well. Hand and brain, great. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think the motive of the cave artist was? Good question. Um, <coughs> The book up has a famous story about how literature invented when people were sitting around the campfire and somebody told a story that or, or, uh, terrified everybody because they cried wolf and people actually thought there was a wolf there. Um, so maybe it has something to do with like evoking animal presences because a lot of the cave paintings are like hunts and things. And at one point when I was working on the wake, I wondered if like cave paintings were the origin of texts because um, they are written, they're, 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 they're engraved. Um, and um, the word learning in English comes from an old English word learning meaning to track or to spoor, or to track an animal um, is learning. And I wondered if like cave painting started to um, install like the idea of lines for reading, um, meaning following a hunt, um, 
kind of. Mm-hmm. I don't know, um, but it's certainly an early manifestation of love writing. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you brought up animals too, because um, how much do we want to and need to or do imitate animals? Because you think of um, the invention of the car and how it actually enhanced isolation where we're traveling sort of together but we're all isolated whereas wolves travel in packs and that whole idea of moving together that I mean in the long run when you look at it wouldn't it have been better if we developed better public transportation than getting everyone in cars I mean, this, this semester I've been walking to school and I'm like taking the bus usually the, the, the passengers are driven but I got so pissed off at the parking uh, people at Berkeley last year that I just said I wasn't going to pay them anything. And I'm finding um, it really takes less time to walk. Um, I feel better, it's healthier, I'm getting exercise. Um, I do run to people, which I wouldn't in my car, and I'm saving money. Um, and also, I'm uh, not burning away the ozone water. And stuff. Right. So, uh, so the services of way out, out uh, scored the disservices. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know how it's going kind to of work once the heavy rains start. Uh, yeah. The and bus system is pretty good. Yeah. And uh, fun that uh, funny that Henry Ford said, uh, when I retire in Greenfield Village, no cars allowed. Huh. <laughs> so or Jews. Uh, huh? Or Jews. <laughs> oh, Joe. <laughs> um, so what's more important, conviction or compromise? This is Ulysses, you know, Stephen is the person with conviction and Bloom is the one who compromises. For me, it's uh, uh, actually, this is something I'm going to write in my book, I don't know if anybody else has written about this, so tell me. In the first chapter you get this big drama about um, Stephen not kneeling down for his mother when he's uh, when she's dying on her deathbed. In the first Bloom chapter, um, you know, he goes to the butcher store and uh, does a lot of things for Molly. So just read this last paragraph on the top of the next page. Following the point of her finger, he took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No. Well, I should say it more as a question. No. Then... She's pointing at something on the floor. Oh, no. Then a twisted gray garter looped around the stocking, rumpled, shiny, soul. No, that book. Other stocking or petticoat? It must have fell down, she said. Keep going, go on. Just a few more lines. He felt her, no, he felt here and there, whoa, I can't pronounce that, vote. Well, you ain't known for a. Wonder, go ahead. This remote sex dungeon line. What does it mean? Um, I, I, I would want to, but I, I, I want to, but I, I wouldn't, I would want to, but I want, I want, I won't, or something like that. I'd want to, but I won't. Wonder if she pronounces that right. Foglio. Not in the bed. Must have slid down. He stooped and lifted the balance. Okay, there we go. So in the first, this is 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. The first chapter is at 8 o'clock in the morning. We get the portrait of a, a young man who's so proud that he won't kneel down for his mother when she's uh, vomiting and dying of liver cancer at the age of 40 after having given birth to 12 kids. At 8 o'clock in the morning on the other side of town, we meet a guy who will kneel down for his wife's underwear. Right. So, Stephen won't kneel and Bloom won't kneel down for anything. And it, it, it sort of raises the question, like, all readers are going to be somewhere in between that. Are you so full of conviction that you don't kneel? Or are you willing to compromise and kneel? And you realize, and of course, reading the book, that Bloom has done too much compromising. You know, he's, like, sold himself. Who grows up wanting to be an advertising salesman? Do you know anybody who aspires to be a salesman? <laughs> <laughs> so how did Bloom get it? His, his life has been a series of compromises where Stephen is stuck to his convictions and they're both like, you know, th- th- there needs to be a compromise between the two. Yeah, very well put. So personally, you you would say that you can't answer what's more important. I think they're, they're both important. Yeah, right? they're equally. Um, is ambition based more on fear or joy? I think it can work, work both ways. So. Yeah. But what different kinds of ambitions, too. There's the kind of ambition that leads to acquisition and consumption. 
Um, what were the motivations again? Is ambition based more on fear or joy? So I'd say that was fear, uh, like material accumulation. And um, there's another kind of ambition. It might be like making something for somebody, that, and giving somebody something is a pleasant thing. I, I caught the Dalai Lama on TV the other day. <coughs> I hadn't spent much time listening to him, but he was a very s smart guy. And uh, he was talking about how in his travels around the world, he thought, met, saw a lot of poor people who uh, had nothing. But who, when they got food for the next day and a meal, were like just overjoyed and yeah. quite content. And on the other hand, people who were wealthy, who had like everything, but kept on feeling the need to get more and more, and were never happy. Yeah. So, um, I don't know why I thought of that. Yeah, no, 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 it, it helps illustrate. Like, it, it illustrates like fearful ambition, I suppose. Yeah. Acquisition. No, that was interesting. I've never had people break down what kind of ambition when I ask the question, so that was good, thank you. Is perception reality? No, uh, um, so I'm thinking of the romantics now. Well, what reality is colorless, odorless, odorless, and tasteless, like water. Colin says, <laughs> Na "Nature is colorless, tasteless, and odorless, like water." Um, reality is like what you remember reality when, when you were like two days old. You were in the middle of reality. It wasn't structured by any human concept. So, right. you had a pure glimpse of the world. Um, it's anarchy. There's nothing there until like people start telling you here, there, up, down. Right. I mean, you make the distinctions because um, when you make distinctions, you make things distinct and they let up. Very good. Uh, Remind me of Utah Phillips says anarchy is making rules for yourself and not other people. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, <coughs> is loyalty based on reason? No, I don't go as it is. Uh, yeah. And so, um, McLuhan talked about feeling in the weight and said that we all have our creative powers we use while we're asleep, we're dreaming, and that the artists dream awake. Have mm -hmm. dreams played a role in your creative process? Well, yeah, because my book is about, like, the Finnegan's Wake is a representation of a dream, so I've done a lot of thinking about dreams and dream analysis too. Heavy. Yeah. Um, which I think I can do. Um, not always well with myself. Yeah. Very good, thank you. And why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? Um, well, some people have considered that possibility, right? The existential... Well, yeah, oh yeah. So, wh but I'm saying why is it so difficult for, m I would say, most people, or for humans in general to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, that was a good point, yeah, people have. So, um, I guess people are uncomfortable without having a sense of direction or of, like, purpose or of, of a goal. Not thinking of a story my ex-wife told me about a friend who worked in a Montessori school, and one day at recess, so, uh, uh, she went and visited and all these kids were running around in a circle and one little girl came up to her and said, When is somebody going to stop us? <laughs> <laughs> that is classic! <laughs> kids need to be, need to be guidelines, so. Yeah. Uh, John, it is a pleasure, <laughs> man. I've never had anyone bowl me away with every answer. It's like, beep, beep, beep. Um, uh, well, um, what's the most significant, you brought up your ex-wife, so that's good. Uh, what's the most significant difference between men and women, say, uh, the physical aside? I'm tempted to say right now just because of, like, my current connections, uh, talkativeness. You know, uh, uh, I'm going to teach Pynchon's Mason and Dixon that in the spring, and uh, I taught it before, but he calls women the loquacious sex in that book. And there's one scene where like uh, there's like a woodcutting crew in the forest and uh, one of the axemen goes up to the foreman and says uh, like two sentences and the foreman replies to him, well if you're going to stand there talking all day, why don't you grow tits and get a dress? <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> and so, well, why do women live longer? So oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah. about, uh, being aware of like, relationships, of, like not doing things independently, but of, like being networked with other people. I think that's more true of women than that. Yeah. Why do you think women live longer than that? Maybe because they are more like uh, uh, involved in relationships. So, you know, one of the theories of like development is that because women don't have to disaffiliate themselves from their mothers. They don't have to like say, I'm, I'm not, I don't wash dishes and I don't like do female things as guys have to do. Women don't have to like separate themselves from their mothers and so they grow up in a sense of like uh, a two-body relationships is like the unit of life instead of like individualism. So a number of French feminists who read about this, that women are kind of like trying to become more sensitive to being in relationships. Yeah, and uh, Frank Zappa uh, made an anti-speed commercial in the '60s. Said, "Don't, don't take speed; it'll turn you into your parents." And I'd find a lot of. Uh, Did he ever take speed? No, no, he's a coffee freak. Because I, I took speed for a, a while. And it is bad news. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, that the low is as bad as the high. Oh yeah, yeah. How you go? You go low. That's a, yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, there's just uh, there's this yeah. uh, uh, terrible drug. Yeah. And so he said it will turn you into your parents. Now, as I've turned, well, you. I think aging turns you into your parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's the, 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 this is just a lead-in, cute, cutesy quote to lead into the question. Basically, I find my peer group, 40s, 50-year-olds, as we turn into our 40s, 50s, and 60s, that women fret more turning into their mothers than men fret turning into either of their presents parents. Huh. Any ideas on that? No, uh, um, I've heard members of both sexes say that, like, as they get older, they're more like their parents. Uh, yeah. Cruz says there's the end of his novel, too, that, you know, he's shocked to learn that he's become his parents. Two lines just to react to and apply as you may. Um, you create what you resist, you are what you hate. That makes sense to me. Yeah idea of projection that uh, you take things that you don't like about yourself and uh, project them outward onto other people and criticize other people for doing things that you secretly despise about yourself yeah huh. like uh, um, not everybody is bothered by the sound of like chewing out loud even that though, but some people find it endearing um, right but if you hate that it says something about you I think yeah hmm very interesting so what elements of your writing have changed and what have stayed the same? And maybe just in regards to, you wrote one book, it took you how long, you, you, you know, and it came out, and then now you're writing three books. What do you see the same in the process, in the execution, you know, and what do you see? You get older, you get smarter. Um, yeah. More, more uh, sensitive to certain things uh, yeah. than you were. Um, so I hope my writing's improved. Um, How long did the first book take to write? Well, it started as my dissertation, so the, it had kind of dissertation in about 10 years. But I, I wrote the dissertation and got here, and maybe uh, after a couple of years I realized I had to do the whole thing over again, so I started writing it from scratch, and that took about four years. Huh. And the three new books are thematically just briefly. One of them is uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm co editing an anthology, um, Joyce and Space, with uh, Valerie Benjamin, Benjamin, who's a professor at the University of Nantes okay. in France. And that's supposed to be the press in a couple weeks. Great. Uh, and then I'm uh, putting together a collection of my essays I'm putting this way to make like a, a book, uh -huh. a kind of sequel to my first book with some reply criticisms. And I hope to get that done by the summer. And I'm also working on a book on Ulysses, which is based on my 66, 43 years of reading it and 39 years of teaching it. Beautiful. That's the one that's most daunting. <coughs> Looking forward to him. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Mos Moshe Feldenkrais, he's a, he works with healing and movement, said it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than uh, we're normally taught to overcome weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a, a weakness of yours that you've actually incorporated to become a strength? Yeah, and I, I've actually like taught something similar in writing courses. Uh, I call it the principle of creative conversion, 
which is like re re learning to reinterpret your worst faults as your finest features. And one of them is like, uh, oh, I'm like treading water on this paper. I can't write. I'm blocked. I just can't go anywhere. No, you're intense. You need to do a lot of thinking before you can get started. Um, it's part of your process. So. And you can always like reinterpret things in a beneficial light. Yeah. yeah. What do you think Joyce was going blind, being a failed singer and a failed playwright? Would you say those were weaknesses that he incorporated to become strengths, or what's your take on well, Joyce? Well, blindness, I think he certainly incorporated as strength. Because I mean, um, one way of thinking about thinning his weight is it's a book that takes place. If it's about my sleep, then the, the protagonist's eyes are closed the entire length of the book. You can't see. And when you're asleep, your eyes are closed. So uh, that, for me, is a sign of like George just taking advantage of his uh, difficulties instead of like wallowing in them. Uh, mm -hmm. And how about the other two? Do you think he considered himself a play failed playwright, trying to be Epson or a failed singer? I don't know if he considered himself a failed right playwright, but uh, most people do. I mean, because most people do. Exiles yeah. is not a great play. Yeah. Here's a joke in Dublin that somebody's doing dramatization of Exiles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and. Um, he, he might have become a professional singer. I'm not sure he was a failed singer. It's yeah. Just that he didn't like take that route. Um, yeah. But all accounts are that he had a great voice and um, people will hear him sing. Yeah. Um, can <coughs> you talk about East embracing contradiction and the West demonizing it? Any thoughts on that? And um, that sounds right, um, but I don't know. I think it doesn't enough about Eastern religion. So I know enough to be able to say that. Uh, states of mind and of being that the West regards as uh, inferior and degraded, like being in a vegetative state, are regarded as higher forms of consciousness in the East. So like Nirvana is like the, uh, uh, the wiping point of the mind from being blank, uh, which is not a good thing in the West. You always got to be busy and doing yeah. something. Interesting because uh, Robert Anton Wilson brought up that great thing that the Zen masters say, you know, the point of in sleep you acquire satori and in the, the point of zen is that you can acquire it while you're awake uh -huh. Uh -huh. and i i i, I uh -huh. thought that was sort of uh, i got a i got a zen kind of a story out here someplace that i can find out it's really short and also while you're looking um can you explain our disdain's culture for old age because, you know, the East sort of respect the elders and American Indians have that thing, you know, let's respect our elders. Mm -hmm. But in the West, we generally show less respect for elders. I've been bothered by that recently too because I'm aging. So um, it's, it's the fixation on like youth and beauty. Yeah. It, it like dominates everything in our culture. Yeah. It's kind of boring, actually. I mean, when I was young and beautiful, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody young is beautiful. But, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what the, what the uh, fetishization of like youth culture is. So. Yeah. I mean, people at that age are beautiful and pretty and um, energetic and full of vitality. So, so everybody ideally like to stay at that age. Yeah. Um, it's like your wake reading club, man. Boy, you got the punchy. In energetic, you know, majority is the young, and then you got your old, sort of solid, you know, elders. Mm -hmm. A couple, but the majority is the young. I was really impressed with that. I think, yeah, there's a, a, an abhorrent like, lack of respect for older people in this culture. Yeah. You see it on the road, like with um, older drivers who are like, yeah. like, like iffy with their emotions, get like honked at and yelled at all the time. Yeah. Just disgusting. And any rituals and routines in your research and writing? So I wish I wrote more. I wish I wrote more ritualistically, like every day. Yeah. I don't, well, I write every day because I have to. But <clears throat> I mean, on my own stuff, I don't do it regularly. Yeah. When I am writing, I like to get up early and I uh, work for like five hours. More than that is like just burnt, spinning wheels. I find yeah. five hours of writing is a good length of time. And I got an idea from Hemingway. Um, he would like, at the end of a day, leave his writing in the middle of a sentence. Um, so um, I, I just like finish writing Isn't in the middle of something so that I know where I'm going to go in the morning and, 
we can like start and not have to like figure out where to go. Beautiful. I read this, you can correct me, that Joyce said in 23 on Hemingway, he has reduced the veil between literature and life, which is what every writer tries to do. Uh -huh. Does that sound right that Joyce said that? Um, it sounds plausible. Why? Yeah. What have we got that? Or I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm. Gonna, I will tell you. I. I figure it out. But in my notes. Mm -hmm. And and so talk about that a little. Maybe. Here's Joyce respecting another writer, saying, "You got to reduce the veil between literature and life." Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's one of the things Hemingway was celebrated for is like his uh, in, 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 like Ezra Pound too is um, economizing the language and getting rid of all the words that don't count or don't do any work. Um, uh, just being as concise and as uh, um, direct as you can. Then Hemingway too, I think, um, well, I, uh, Joyce is saying nice things about Hemingway could have been motivated by politics since Hemingway was affiliated with Gertrude Stein and they all want, they were all kind of like doing PR for each other. Right. Um, they're kind of, Hemingway tends to devalue thought. The more you think, the, the, the weaker you are as a character. Um, people who are admired are they just do things, they just act without thinking, um, don't have any regrets. That's, uh, Bukowski says, I don't write, I, I, I don't try, I just do. Mm -hmm. And he becomes the author that's the most stolen book in bookstores. <laughs> but, but Bukowski's books are the most stolen books. So, um, very interesting. Um, Joseph Boys, uh, who actually wrote his mm -hmm. own extra chapter of Finnegan's Wake, uh, said, I didn't know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he, as an art piece, he, he, uh, make, he said, make the secrets productive. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a secret? A personal secret? Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I'm sure I have them, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, That's a hard question. Yeah, well, that's all right, no problem. Um, Lewis Carroll said, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? No, not lately. I used to when I was young, younger, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm more, I'm more like weighted down by a sense of like limitations and uh, constraints on possibilities at this point in my life. Right. Can anger be a productive emotion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can set, did I already say this? Can satire be destructive? Yeah, we yeah, already we did that one. That. Sorry. Um, how do you find peace of mind? Um, music. I play the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of pleasure out of that. Um, I walk. And uh, video and video and reading um, are relaxing. Yeah. And um, I tend to use substances too. Um, I'm ashamed to say. I wish I didn't, uh, but I like wine. Yeah. And um, herbal, herbal materials. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong to be ashamed of that. I think that's a natural tendency. So I do, I've got a friend who uh, uh, says to people who don't smoke, uh, "You're living in like one of the prime growing areas in the world." <laughs> <laughs> and what? Uh, well, wasn't Joyce? He was a real uh, engager in, oh, he in drank, alcohol. Uh, yeah, he'd like to kick, put it back. Well, he's what? Irish. But he's right. Yeah. But but beer or wine? Whiskey. Whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Really. When he died of like a purple maybe. Do do a do a an ulcer. Do an ulcer, which is was caused by his drinking. I think uh, drinking contributed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. John, if you were walking down the street and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? Um, I was. I felt kind of empowered at 12. I was. I was like uh, thrown for a loop by puberty because I. I grew up like more slowly than the kids in my classes I, I developed later, so I always felt like I was not in the same group. So I suppose I would have said something about not worrying about like adolescence or yeah. um, taking a stride. I don't know if you can do that to a 12 year old, but yeah. adolescence is a horrible state. Yeah, <laughs> and then not, not necessarily in a response, but what do you think your 12 year old self walking down the street would say to you? Uh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, which way, and I saw, I've used your bathroom, but which way do you think toilet paper should come off the roll, over or under? I used to do it over, but then a lot of my female friends were pointing out to me that this was like um, male aggrandizement, and so I, I put it under now. Ah, <laughs> wow! Because I mean, you, you just kind of looked bad like when you put it over. <laughs> that I thought, I thought was like the macho, kind of macho assertion. Man, because I I always get then I ask why, so you incorporated the why, right? If the, uh, a publisher came to you and said. We'd like to publish your autobiography, John. Just off the top of your head, what the t what would be the title? Uh, Notes of a Mismanaged Life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said we'd like to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? Huh. Um. Coffee. Um. Fine. Yeah, it's a good smell. If there was a large statue built in your honor, where would you want it displayed, and what would it be made of? Huh. <coughs> in the middle of uh, Duenal Plaza, I like to be made of snow. <laughs> All right. Where is that plaza? Duenal Plaza in Berkeley. In Berkeley. Yeah. Great. And uh, tell me something Actually, good. Actually, make, oh. make that like stainless steel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tell me something good you never had and you never want. Huh. Um. Um, a big house in a gated community. I had dinner on Friday with a guy, a guy who came to Brooklyn the same year I did him. Mitch Brightwiser. <coughs> He's now living in Arinda with his wife who teaches at a private school, so they've got two salaries. They're, they've got this house that's got 37,000 square feet, and he can drive motor vehicles around in there, fly helicopters, and it's in the middle of a forest with like a, a, a brook behind it. You see deer, you know, breakfast time. And I got back in there, I felt like a failure. Um, yeah. But he told me how they're renting this for $4,300 a month, um, which I couldn't do. Yeah. And I don't know how they're going to do it. But they're rationing up. they got a 16-year-old daughter. They want to like live with her, spend with her for two years, and then buy something more downgraded right. and move out. Um, they told me that like the place they've got is like a dump compared to her, the daughter's friend's houses, which are like in Blackhawk. Yeah. And they've got it's in, she's got friends in Blackhawk who no, not only live in the skated community, but their houses are gated inside the gated community. <laughs> So I could do without that. That's that was a good answer to that. So people would go, that that's a that's you can't answer that, and that's actually a very reasonable. Answer. So I mean, those people they're like in prison themselves. Yeah. But they lock themselves into a community and lock themselves into their houses. They don't yeah. want they don't want anybody to touch them. Yeah. <coughs> um, if you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me add a question here. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago. Um, if it would bring about world peace, would you eat L sharp and shit? <laughs> <laughs> would you say? Oh, I think I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was good. You know, you notice what you did. You gestured. So we're going to have to say to the audience listening huh. that you ducked to the side. I and, and that's beautiful. That's that whole sense ratio shifting that we... Well, George Bush with the shoe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was the one great thing he did as a president was to not get hit by the shoe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the healthiest cultural shift you see developing today? Obama. Obama's election. Yeah, very good. And what's the most overrated idea? Deconstruction. Nice. And uh, uh, what gives you the most optimism? Huh. Um, I guess Joyce. Um, um, at the end of Ulysses, you got um, you know Molly falling asleep and thinking of Gibraltar and the Jess and the cactuses and the jessamine and the rose gardens. All these little blooms going off into the future at the end of Ulysses. So, uh, you know, we're, it's a this question of whether or not Leopold and Molly will have any more blue children. And at the end of Finnegan's Wake, too, um, um, this woman dying, uh, but 
like wishing well for her children. Look, George is writing in 1939 as Europe is descending into fascism, and um, he's dying and he knows it. <clears throat> but he's seeing like um, the future being carried forward in the minds of children, and just regarding this as like a, a sign that the earth is going to renew itself, that new people are going to take over, young people, and uh, that the world will go on. Mm, that was good. Um, in, in regards to that, George... It's interesting to know what he, what he would have thought out if he had seen World War II. Yeah. In the bomb. Yeah. Well, he, he predicts the bomb mm -hmm. in a way. Well, I mean, how, what word do you use? Do you know what causes these phones to twerk? <laughs> I don't know. know. Is it... Uh, it might be the charging thing. Does it do it when it's outside the charger? I don't know. Um, it's interesting you brought up Joyce, and I appreciate that. In um, you know, we got the book right here uh, on t under the tape recorder. How Joyce wrote Finnegan's Wake, but you know, um, maybe in you, all your years studying Joyce, reading Joyce, and uh, writing about him. Uh, was he just a special person? Why was it him who created this? Any ideas on that? I mean, well, I think he was really incredibly smart uh, and, and a special person. If you read the essays he wrote, like when he was an undergraduate, um, or like in his twenties, they're astonishing. I couldn't have done that um, yeah. at that age. Pynchon is another person like that. Too. Yeah, um, just a remarkable writer. Um, but then it's how. It's sort of like, oh, I know what, what I was getting on is, how, well, how, first of all, how does he... He said some place that uh, um, he felt fortunate to have achieved what he did because there were so many people who were smarter than, than him who didn't want to cultivate their talents and let them go to seed. And then <clears throat> looking at some of the manuscripts that they've come up with recently, like the, the new papers in the National Library of Ireland, which are being curated by... Uh, uh, Luca Crispi, uh, he worked incredibly hard. Uh, he just wrote and rewrote and rewrote. Um, he really applied himself to it. Um, one of the things they discovered in his papers is that um, when Joyce began writing, he was already working on Molly when he began writing Ulysses, so people weren't aware of that until they, his papers came along. And Sirens went through this incredible number of drafts. So, so he really worked hard. Yeah, that's good. In, but what word do you use to describe him possibly having like ESP or coincidence or synchronicity? I think he had confidence, just an amazing confidence in himself and his ability to turn whatever he's doing into something important. There's a remark he makes about how um, the genius of, a, of, of an artist's work lies in the scribblings. If the scribblings don't have anything, it's not going to develop into anything good. And you get the impression you just started that scribbling and the scribbles grew into Ulysses and Finian's Wake. Um, and I gotta say, one of the reasons I was attracted to Joyce is that I'm not a confident person. And so like the spectacle of this guy who could, at the age of 21, pick up with a woman and leave, leave his country for good and start writing books that he knew would be great. It's just uh, astonishing to me. Right. I could never have done anything like that. My parents would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he had a form of uh, ESP? No, but uh, uh, I don't know if he did or not. Um, I think he had the capacity to like take coincidences and make productive moments out of them. Um, so I think he's a talent. He's interested in ESP and, and uh, putting his weight because putting his weight is about uh, subliminal and the subconscious. So right. Spiritualism and um, everything associated with it gets into putting his weight. But say that whole thing about sort of predicting the Nagasaki, you know, in the certain uh -huh. pages and saying that. How, how do you explain that? Is that coincidence or is that... So that's true. Uh, you know, how, and there's, there's so many, you know, incidences in our reading club where we go, oh, that's about some current event. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you, you actually had John Snyder give the paper how the election in 2000 was all about was all contained within the way uh, again. That was great paper. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how about that? It, you know, Bob actually says, well, all writers have ESP. And maybe some have mm -hmm. more of a degree. Your thoughts on that, Any? I mean... Well, I, I'm not a big 
uh, I'm not a big believer in like paranormal stuff. Right. It hasn't happened to me. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see any evidence for it. So it's more coincidence in your regard? I think coincidence. So yeah. Or you can read anything into anything. Coinci well, coincidence just means like two incidents happening together. It's like coincidence, two incidents right. happening together. Every time I go outside, the birds start to sing. Right. Um, do I cause it? Um, <laughs> just co two incidents happening simultaneously but like the ability to connect to incidents in a meaningful way is I think that's a talent and yeah. you just could do it <clears throat> yeah and like when I teach uh, modern literature I teach Joyce like in relation to Elliot and those guys and central lines in the wasteland for me are <clears throat> I can connect and he breaks the line s signifying lack of connection I can connect nothing with nothing and I Say for jo uh, Joyce, Joyce's uh, mantras, I can connect anything with anything. <laughs> That's good. And check this pinch and uh, how he um, defines what paranoia is. Uh -huh. uh, which, you know. What's the rules par for paranoia out of Gravity's Rainbow? Say it again? The rules for paranoia out of Gravity's Rainbow? Uh, I'm not sure where this is. Maybe you can tell me. But first of all, the word paranoia, para means near, and the other word, mean, the other part means mind or reason. Mm -hmm. He says, paranoia is r the realization that everything is connected. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of interesting enough. That's the, the, the two extremes in tension. You guys like two characters who embody them are somebody who believes that there's a organization or structure in the world, um, which is paranoid. Um, you believe that somebody's actually in control. Yeah. And the other point of view is like, it's just chaos. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, um, what do you think it is the thing in Joyce that in in say Finnegan's wake that makes it transcendent that makes it enables us to flip our consciousness what is it in Finnegan's wake that enables us uh, you know that makes it transcendent mm. I suppose uh, uh, prim uh, foundationally and primarily like the unsettling with normal language so that words don't connect to clear meanings the way they do in other texts. So they kind of lead into puzzles and make you wonder if they're pointing to something outside of what's already defined or if they're combining concepts. We well, yeah, say the language. Mm -hmm. And why is this often elusive? Why is this element often elusive in all great art? Which element? The element that makes it transcendent, and, and this is more in general, and specifically with Joyce and in in art, in, in all the great writings in art in general, why is that thing most elusive? Um, maybe because it's just not calculable, or, or um, um, form, form, you can't put it into a formula or anything. Uh, it either happens or it doesn't. If if I could say like what make a work of art transcendental, I could make millions of dollars. That's like, instead of wrong answers like beep, you won. <laughs> right. if, if somebody asked like what makes two people fall in love, if I knew that, you know, I could uh, I could wake up. <laughs> right. Um, and here's the line, um, sort of like thinking about what Joyce did in Finnegan's Wake in the the over. Um, the sort of information swirl we live in, um, the multiplicity of media, this sort of sensory overload, alienates us from identifying with any one medium. So we get detached from the hypnotic effects of each medium. Can you react to that at all? Yeah, I'm not sure it's true. Uh, I have my TV on all the time. Yeah. And I, 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 even though I'm not listening to the sound while I'm like, writing a large recommendation or doing uh, paperwork. But when I'm reading, I get totally lost in the reading and things turn off and um, I lose awareness of my surroundings. It's kind of like going into a trance. So. Yeah. Or Jeffrey Hartman, the, <coughs> the Yelp critic, has a nasty thing which he talks about like concentration is a higher state of mind. It's like you leave the world and enter a kind of special space when you're reading or, or concentrating on writing or studying. Uh-huh. You're still, you're still making yeah, it. still doing it. So yeah. Uh, and so, um, the two things McLuhan said about understanding, because he was a big guy, that the p two big things in McLuhan are relationships and understanding. Mm -hmm. And he said, understanding is not having a point of view. 
Huh. Now, it's that fun. Sense, yeah. yeah, it's funny because the other way McLuhan says this is called suspended judgment. Mm -hmm. And I, I recently read the Guardian Review of Finnegan's Wake from 1939, and they use the word suspended judgment. Uh -huh. And, you know, did Joyce ever talk about this, or is this something they're just applying on it? No, he never talked about it, but he embodies it. Uh, one of the things in Ulysses is you realize very quickly that there's no black or white to anything, that these characters are complex, that they all have their foibles and weaknesses, but there are virtues too. Nobody's villainized or is like right or wrong in Ulysses, so yeah. or in the wake. The central theme might be fallibility. Everybody everybody falls, so yeah. at the end of life, but in the middle too. Yeah. And the other uh, thing about understanding is um, McLuhan says uh, experience usually shapes our behavior, mm -hmm. whereas understanding should shape our behavior. Can you d talk about that at all, the, the difference between experience and understanding in, in that regard? Mm -hmm. Something you said earlier, uh, it's quick with something you said earlier, it reminded me of something else. I'm trying to think what you said about maybe overcoming like prejudice or um, something to born in. Uh, well, most you felt in Christ where you use a weakness to over, uh, incorporate to become a strength? No, something different. What I'm, what I'm uh, thinking of though is I, I wrote something recently on the Prank Man episode of the week, uh -huh. which has. Um, um, uh, the, the riddles, why am I a look like a pasta porter piece? Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, uh, Yalvan who tails back to Franklin after she asked the question, I'm likelihood, or I'm liking it. And people have tried to translate those questions into like English forms, and you can't do it. Uh, uh -huh. But what seems significant to me is that you know, the question, why am I a like, why am I a look alike to pasta porter, pasta porter piece, has somewhere in it the statements, um, why am I like, why do I look like, um, and they all bear on the idea of likeness, and they got me thinking about the word like, um, which comes from an Indo European word that's related to words for body. Uh, the German word like means corpse. And um, likeness, uh, it, it's, an it's, a, it's, an, it's, a it's a preposition, um, a verb, and third part of speech too. Oh, adjective, uh, uh, I like mine. Uh -huh. So, um, and they'll have, they, they kind of like reveal like, I think these primordial understandings that you like things that you're like, and you, you like uh, uh, people who are like you like you. It, like this is kind of a xenophobic word, you, you tend to like what you're like. Um, and so overcoming like um, Beneficial prejudices is those people are like you, and, and adverse ones to people who are unlike, I think, has fueled a lot of tension in the world. Very good. It reminds me of Igor Stravinsky said, most people don't know what they like, they like what they know. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. it's interesting, everyone likes to read a book by themselves, quietly. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just discuss why is it so dang essential to read Finnegan's Wake out loud with a group of people? I mean, that's really, did Joyce say both items or just out loud? What, 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 what? Well, he says uh, you got to read Finnegan's Wake out loud. Doesn't Joyce actually say that somewhere? I think he does. Yeah, but he doesn't say maybe so much with a group of people. Uh, no, I, I don't recall. But um, but it is sort of, I would say, pretty essential that you read Finnegan's Wake out loud with a group of people. Yeah, no, I think so. Too. Yeah. And so why is that? Just to flip this experience we're so used to. It's also important to read it alone with a dictionary, too, and like doing philology and stuff. Right. right. But um, having other voices um, certainly helps. Yeah. And why is, why do we have to read it out loud? Um... Reading out loud brings up very possibilities you can't notice when you're like just looking with the eye. It gets, yeah. gets back to the the, the sound, the the, the uh, telephony and tele television kind of struggle. But language involves both visual perception of letters on a page, but then turning those into sounds. So if you just look at the book, you're not going to get some of the sounds um, to generate meaning. 
It also brings in some of the comedy, I think. Right. Um, and, and the beauty of the language. Right. Do you think uh, <coughs> Robert Anton Wilson's right? It's the dirtiest and funniest book ever written, and if they advertise it that way, it'd sell better? Yes. <laughs> Did you ever talk to Robert Anton Wilson about the way? No, I never met. Yeah. Is he still alive? No, he died. And, and there is a, a little sh a clip of him reading it out loud. Huh. It's, it's you think it'd be on YouTube? Or? Uh, it could be on YouTube. It's on a DVD. Mm -hmm. um, Martha Graham said, Great artists aren't ahead of their times. They are their times. Uh -huh. Now, that's an interesting paradox because really, Joyce is ahead of his time. So he's creating hypertext, he's creating, you know, all this amazing stuff, but he is his times at the same time. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, how, how, would, how would you discuss that paradox? Or any ideas there? Mm, well, I think he anticipated like some of the post-structural um, uh, terms and criticism theory that took place after the 60s, so in that sense he was ahead of his time. The idea that language, um, um, uh, words in the English language aren't nailed to like reality. A tree doesn't always mean a tree. Right. It can be like an abstract red, um, uh, something to put a shoe on. Right. Uh, the idea that language is uh, um, polysemous, uh, many meaning, many meaning. To, uh, yeah. I can't be pinned down to one meaning. Right. And it starts in Ulysses, uh, even earlier. And that Joyce and like some of his contemporaries created texts that made it necessary for critics to develop these ideas after them. I think the creative writers were ahead of the theorists. The creative writers are ahead of the theorists. Uh, they're, they're developing things that have to be accounted for after the fact. Yeah. Well, how about Thoreau and Emerson? They have any, uh, you know, uh, effect on Joyce? Because Emerson said, do something without knowing how or why. Mm -hmm. And if a general person looks at Finnegan's Wake, they'll go, is this guy doing something, you know, he doesn't know how or why, but, you know, the deeper layer is, yeah, he's completely in control. Mm -hmm. Any ideas about the transcendentalists? <coughs> I don't think Jewish and Emerson are the transcendentalists very deeply, if they knew them at all. Yeah. Um, he, he didn't have, like, a, a, a burning interest in American literature, um, unless it, like, resonated with, um, his work. So Huckleberry Finn had the word Finn in it, so it became part of Finn in his way. Um, and Emerson was like an heir to the Romantics, to Coleridge and the British Romantics, and I think to us would have known more directly. Uh -huh. Might have got some of the same ideas from them. Uh -huh. And certainly the idea that like um, the thinking of children and of um, it's the kinds of thinking that ha happens in dreams, reveries, fantasies, um, daydreaming, us of the imagination are superior to like rational knowledge. That's very much a romantic idea. Yeah. All knowledge does is like fuck you up. <laughs> um, That's funny because there's the other line, knowledge will set you free. So the romantic is actually more complicated. The, 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 the program, what Wordsworth is like, his program is the prelude is a poem about his life and it's a story of how he comes to realize how screwed up he is because he's been educated and then the effort is to try and like use the education he's got to figure out how to undo it. So, um, and that's all, the, the hand that wounds is the hand that heals, as Carlisle's one. Wow. They, they use the mind to like, cure the mind of what's been done to it by authority. Yeah, and Twain says, when you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, we got about five more minutes, is that right? We finish off this tape? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, and another line that came up in my head as we were talking earlier about the I whole idea of thinking is Bridget Bardot says, when I make love, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And it's so, yeah, <laughs> it's so hard. We cannot really not think. Is it possible? You know, that it's sort of that whole idea when you meditate, you try to think about nothing, but you got to think about not thinking. Well, being asleep is not thinking. Um, yeah. <coughs> a part of my book is to point out that I'm... Um, um, most of sleep is not not dreaming. It's like just being blank, um, having a vacant mind. Um, and Joyce writes about that, which is hard. Like he fulfills the aspiration of the whole um, tradition of Western writers to write a book about nothing, and he does it brilliantly because nothing turns out to be as richly um, full of feel. There are lots of lots of kinds of nothing. Um, there's a nothing you have in childhood, infancy, you don't remember anything. 
the nothing that fills your head when you laugh, the nothing that goes you to sleep, the nothing that's in your mind when you have orgasm, um, the nothing that's there when you die, presumably. Um, yeah. So, nothing is a lot of things where no thing, nothing making new thing, wealth show ever. Nothing making nothing whatsoever, but nothing making new thing, wealth show ever. Um, you keep on finding different kinds of nothing. That's good. Yeah, very good. How about that line, abnilliation of the atom? I didn't, uh -huh. I've mispronunciated it, of course. Maybe you can say it correctly. The abnilization of the atom. What is your take on the meaning of that term in the way? Well, multiple. It's, a, it's the, uh, the uh, annihilation of the atom. It's the uh, um, annihilation of matter and the annihilating power of the atomic bomb, which is described in that paragraph. But abnihila means like from nothing. And the atom is like uh, the um, atom is in Greek means truth. So etymology is like the study of the truth. It's where words come from. So looking from where, where words come from out of nothing is sort of the enterprise of his way too. Seeing where the atom comes of me hello. So for, uh, for deconstructionists like, um, and post-structuralists, they always use this phrase always already. Language is always already there. Nobody came up with it. It's just like a fact that everybody, everybody who's been human has been born into. But Joyce, I think, was uh, Analyzed by the idea of trying to speculate where language come from, came from, that it had to have words in some place. And for the deconstructionists, you can't get to the origins of language because it's always already there, but I think Joyce thought you could, or people would speculate. Well, isn't it Chomsky who believes we're hardwired with language? Yes. And so they, they must love Chomsky. The, the deconstructions say it was already hardwired in it? No, because it, uh, uh, the deconstructions want language to be totally arbitrary, a kind of like artificial system that's been generated to help us communicate with each other, but it doesn't have any kind of real connection to anything. Um, uh, interesting. Uh, 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 Reminded me of uh, Joyce said, mistakes are the portals of discovery. And Zappa said, stupidity is the building block of the universe. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, maybe you can talk about that a little. Where Joyce, what was Joyce meaning when he said mistakes are portals of the universe? Let me see if I can find this list of uh, advice that I got, which includes things like, um, never under, un under any circumstances take a laxative and a sleeping pill on the same day. My favorite one is, uh, if at first you don't succeed, Skydiving is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one about learning from experience that's fun too. Uh, yeah. I actually saw that laxative one was a card in a bathroom in a bar. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like right. ten things that you shouldn't do. Or uh huh. Uh, this from bad experience, and a lot, a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, say it again so that tape can. Good judgment. Where's this again? Um, Good judgment comes from bad experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. All right. And so, um, talking about um, decision making, since you're involved with decision making in your writing, mm -hmm. Ginsburg says, first thought, best thought. Jonah uh, Lur uh, wrote a book called uh, How We Decide, said, fast, blink, decisions are not always useful. And then Malcolm Gladwell, the blink guy, says, talks about gut decision making. Mm -hmm. What guides your decision making? My intuitions matter a lot. Like, I, I, I do think like the first idea you come up with is usually the right one. Then yeah. Then you rationalize it and complicate it. Yeah. I'm not sure it always works, but that's the way I kind of like what right. things. Uh, it reminds me also, uh, McClellan says, I don't know what I think until I've said it. Joan Didion says, I don't know what I think until I've written it. Uh -huh. Any uh, feedback on those ideas? I say writing, writing kind of like a particular sense for me. Yeah. Yeah, it forces you to kind of get your thoughts together in ways to talk. You can, like, be elusive in talking. Yeah. The Joan Rivers thing reminded me of a line I got off of, it was channel hopping one night and came to this Christian station and there was a comic performing. It was actually quite good. The line, uh, 
Ever since I've been born, it's been one thing after another. I've had no time to myself. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. Well, we'll wrap it up here soon. Uh, a couple things on poetry. What do you think the function of poetry is? Uh, like to do something we were talking about earlier to like make you look at life differently, uh, so that life becomes more interesting or wider. Um, and uh, also to like entrance with just like the pleasure of language. Um, it's a form of musicality and, and of uh, um, sexual pleasure, giving just the sounds. So. Yeah, Elliot said it's outing the inner dialogue. Uh -huh. Yeah. And also Elliot said about, talked about uh, having the experience but missing the meaning. Yes. Oh, well, I just read this poem. Uh, uh, let me show it to you. Uh, somebody gave a talk like last week on Lewis McNeese, the Irish poet. And um, prior to the talk, I read some of McNeese's poetry. Let me show you the poem here. Sure. A poem by Lewis McNeese entitled uh, Bagpipe Music. It's no go the merry-go-round, it's no go the rickshaw. All we want is a limousine and a ticket for the peep show. Their knickers are made of crepe de chine, their shoes are made of python, their halls are lined with tiger rugs, and their walls with heads of bison. John MacDonald found a corpse, put it under the sofa, waited till it came to life, and hit it with a poker. Sold its eyes for souvenirs, sold its blood for whiskey, kept its bone for dumbbells to use when he was fifty. It's no go the yogi man, it's no go Blavatsky, all we want is a bank balance and a bit of skirt and a taxi. Annie McDougall went to milk, caught her foot in the heather, woke to hear a dance record playing of old Vienna. So it's no go your maidenheads, it's no go your culture. All we want is a Dunlop tire and the devil mend the puncture. The Laird of Phelps spent haga money declaring he was sober, counted his feet to prove the fact, and found he had one foot over. Mrs. Carmichael had her fifth, looked at the job with repulsion, said to the midwife, take it away. I'm through with overproduction. It's no go the gossip column, it's no go the Sealy. All we want is a mother's help and a sugar stick for the baby. Willie Murray cut his thumb, couldn't count the damage. Took the hide of an Ayrshire cow and used it for a bandage. His brother cost three hundred cram when the seas were lavish. Threw the bleeders back in the sea and went upon the parish. It's no go the herring board, it's no go the Bible. All we want is a pack of fags when our hands are idle. It's no go the picture palace, it's no go the stadium. It's no go the country cot with a pot of pink geraniums. It's no go the government rant, grants. It's no go the elections. So sit on your arse for 50 years and hang your head on a pension. It's no go, my honey love. It's no go, my poppet. Work your hands from day to day. The winds will blow for the profit. The glass is falling hour by hour. The glass will fall forever. But if you break your bloody glass, you won't hold up the weather. Woo! So what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I heard some things that made it sound like uh, wake, wakeian. I see. Yeah, um, the corpse. So I read this and it was like totally uh, uh, opaque to me, and then I heard this lecture and it made sense. It's, it's uh, you start to notice there's like uh, a we and a they. Yeah. And the we is speaking from the point of view of like these native Celtics living in the Hebrides Islands, whose culture is being taken over by consumption, the, the tiger rugs and the, the white palaces and yeah. the peep shows and the taxis. Uh, so it's like uh, no go, no go. The encroachment of my culture. Right, John. What a way to end. Thank you so much, man. Okay. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank um, you, John. Actually, let me do this. Man. Yeah.